All right, hello there, everybody. If you are watching this right now, it's because I was not able to make it in. Um, we are going to talk about the growing Islamic world today. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to make sure you got the story um, from the other day, from the last two days, from the video and from the reading that you did about the early Islamic history. Um, and there's just a couple of things I kind of want to highlight. So if you want to grab your notes, um, that you took from the textbook the other day um, and grab your moving notes out, do that, and then we're going to touch base real quick. I'll pause. Okay. Um, so first of all, something I want you to add into your notes is what Islam means. Um, Islam means submission. The word means submission. Um, and that's really kind of connected to um, all matters of faith, complete submission of faith uh, to your faith. Um, and I think it's best connected uh, to the first pillar. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. Um, and so uh, I want you to add that in, the idea that Islam needs submission. Um, in your notes, I would make sure you highlight the Quran. Um, and there's one part that I want to make sure you know about that. Um, that Muslims believe that the Quran was revealed to the prophet um, by the angel of God. By the, actually, the angel Gabriel, the same one that those of you know the Christmas story, came and scared the bejesus out of a bunch of shepherds and was like, hey. Um, but that's different than being written by a man because this, this, this holy book is revealed as the word of God to this prophet. And that's an important factor um, as far as submitting to that faith and submitting to that word. Uh, the video did a neat job talking about the importance of the word uh, in traditional Arabian culture um, and how that transferred and in fact grew under Islam. Um, I expect you to know the five pillars. Um, I expect you to know what they are and what they mean. Um, I expect you to understand the concept of jihad, that it means struggle. And that to most Muslims, that means the struggle to be a better Muslim, the internal jihad, um, whereas to some extremists, uh, it's an external jihad to conquer and to force convert around. Um, and then I want you to also make sure you know the Shira, the Islamic holy law, uh, that this is more than just a religious law, that this becomes um, social, family, business, politics. Uh, that it really kind of becomes all-encompassing. Um, and then obviously the early story, um, uh, Muhammad started in Mecca, started this religion, basically got kicked out because it threatened everything that Mecca was. Um, it threatened its, its status as a pagan, as a uh, polytheistic religious center, a trade center, um, and they wanted him out. So they went to Medina. Um, and there he was welcomed and his numbers grew. Uh, and then he eventually comes back to Mecca, uh, conquers Mecca, destroys the Kaaba, as you read about yesterday, or watched the video yesterday as well. Um, and this starts the spread of Islam. Um, now, if you would turn to the expansion of Islam lecture uh, that I have for you there, then we will uh, start on that now. So uh, now would be a time to pull that out. So um, we're talking about the growth of Islam here. We're going to talk about the growing Islamic world. So what we're going to see is that basically during Muhammad's lifetime, that's the salmonish color here, um, the Islam came to dominate much of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, so letter A there is came to dominate the much of the Arabian Peninsula during Muhammad's lifetime. Um, and that's that spot in there. Um, and the next hundred years is going to see massive, rapid expansion. Um, it was the fastest spreading religion ever in the history of humankind. Um, it's still the fastest growing uh, currently, um, but obviously separated by 1,500 years. Um, but it's going to undergo massive, rapid growth. And essentially what we're going to see um, within a century, basically, uh, Islam is going to spread all the way from the Indus River here in the east um, all the way into, uh, into Europe. 
um, and they're pushed all the way into Spain. Um, and so that's what I have number two here. They controlled Spain um, and made their way into France and were actually poised to take Europe. Um, we haven't studied Europe yet, but we will in just a few weeks. Um, Europe, if you remember, after the fall of Rome, was completely decentralized. There was no strong central power anymore. Um, and so this powerful Islamic force coming through um, really probably could have taken pretty much the whole continent had they got past the Franks. The Franks were the one strong group that really posed a rivalry to the uh, to the Islamic Empire. Um, but they were stopped here at the Battle of Tours um, in 732. Uh, so that's what they have here. They start the Europe in the Battle of Tours. And then what's funny is the Muslims never come back into Europe again because uh, there's no real reason to try again. Uh, that's what I have as the arrow. There's no real reason. There's no reason to try again. Um, what they saw of Europe was poor. Uh, there wasn't a lot there for the taking, um, and it wasn't really worth the effort. And so um, they get repelled, and they kind of slink back into Spain, and they're like, all right, we're good. Uh, but now looking at this map and seeing how quick this religion spread, um, is really, I mean, it's kind of mind blowing. You know, this is all within a century of, of its founding. And so the question is, why did it spread so quickly? Um, well, one of the big reasons is a lot of people under the Persian and Byzantine empires uh, saw them as liberators. Um, you had a large Persian empire here, you had the Byzantine empire all throughout here. And the Islamic world was offering them something different than either of these other empires. Uh, and they saw them as liberators. I think another reason they were spread so quickly is generally speaking, the Muslims were tolerant to the people of the book. It's an important phrase to know. They were tolerant to the people of the book. That was. Jews and Christians who they felt that was all the same book. The Hebrew Torah, the Christian Bible, and the Islamic Quran were all in the same compendium, all in the same uh, Abrahamic tradition. Um, the Muslims obviously had different views than Christians who had different views than Jews. Um, but Muslims said, you know what, we're all part of the same story. And so they didn't persecute them. Uh, they usually just taxed them at a slightly higher rate um, if you weren't Muslim, uh, but they were not persecuted by any stretch. Uh, and then just militarily speaking, uh, the Islamic armies were united behind their faith uh, and their desire to spread their faith. So the Islamic armies were united behind their faith and their desire to spread their faith. There was, there was a lot of religious fervor, a lot of religious excitement. Why don't you take a moment right now and touch base with your partner. Uh, make sure you have pretty much the same things written down. So, okay, next we're going to talk about divisions in Islam. So this, this it's growing, growing so rapidly, so incredibly. Oh, geez, I almost forgot. I have, I have maps here. The Battle of Tours, I forgot, man, what am I thinking? There's the Battle of Tours up here. It's also called the Battle of Poitiers. Uh, it was fought by, the, on the Frankish side, a guy by the name of Charles Martel, which means Charles the Hammer. Got all about my pictures here. Um, so, but then, um, so now we're going to see divisions within Islam. So I'm on Roman numeral two now. Um, within about 30 years of Muhammad's death, divisions start to appear. So divisions start to appear. Uh, and really, there's a debate over who should be caliph, uh, who should be the spiritual leader of the Islamic world. That's what that word means, the caliph. Spiritual leader of the Islamic world. So what basically happens is that the fourth caliph after Muhammad is a guy by the name of Ali, uh, who is Muhammad's cousin. 
also his son-in-law. But whatever. He's related to Muhammad. He's directly related to Muhammad. So the fourth caliph after Muhammad is Ali, who's related to Muhammad. And in 661, Ali is murdered. And this sets off a conflict that's going to divide Islam. Ali is murdered, and this sets off a conflict that is going to divide Islam. And so we get two sects, two different groups of Islam. Um, one is the Shiites, and we frequently refer to them as the Shia. Um, they are a minority of the Islamic world. Today, they are 10 to 12 percent. Um, they have never been a majority. Um, there's only a couple countries where they are the majority. Um, Iran being one of them, but we'll get to that much later. Um, they believe that only the descendants of Ali can be Caliph. So they believe that only the descendants of Ali, only someone directly related to him can be Caliph. And generally speaking, they are more orthodox and more authoritarian. When we say orthodox, we mean they follow a strict letter of the law guideline. Um, what I have for the arrow is they're much more rigid, um, often much more extreme also. The vast majority of the Islamic world is Sunni, really everywhere outside of Iran for the most part, is Sunni. And they believe that any devout Muslim can be caliph. So any devout Muslim can be Caliph. Um, and they basically think that each country has their own religious leadership. So each country has their own religious leadership. All right, take a quick sec, check with your partner, make sure you've got everything the same on Roman numeral two. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to talk about some of the Islamic empires um, and these Islamic states. Um, before we do that, though, um, I do want to make sure that you got the word Uma uh, from your textbook reading. It's sometimes spelled with an H, sometimes without an H. Um, either one is fine. Um, Uma is the Islamic religious community. It is not a state. It is not an empire. Um, it's a cultural, a language um entity um so it's not a formal state the rest of what we're going to be talking about we're going to be talking about several different empires and dynasties and kingdoms those are states the Uma itself though is kind of bigger than that it unites the entire islamic world um and especially important to that is language um is the arabic language um which really unites uh unites most all Muslims. Uh, so the first dynasty we're going to see, and you see this is this start, so if you look at the year 661, um, this is essentially right after the death of Ali. Um, and so this is when uh, the Islamic Empire, Islamic becomes a, a larger empire. And so this is, the dark is before the first caliphate. Uh, caliphate is just a word with a caliph, which is the leader. You have a caliphate, the same way a king has a kingdom, right? Okay. Um, so anyway, so this is the first, and the, this is before the caliphate. This is the first four caliphs, and then the Umayyad caliphate, or the Umayyad dynasty. Um, is the largest one and is, in fact, the largest extent we're going to see the Islamic world um, in one empire. So this is where you see all the way, these the lines are the modern borders there. Um, so this is all the way from the Indus River Valley, which is right in here, um, all the way through Spain. Um, its capital was in Baghdad, uh, which is in Iraq. Um, their conquest, as I just said, was from the Indus through Spain. 
Their conquest was from the Indus through Spain. It was their armies that fought the Battle of Tours um, that lost in Spain and came back, or excuse me, lost in France uh, and just came back to hold Spain. Now, what's unique about the Umayyad is they emphasize the Arabic Muslim. Now, let's go over this real quick. This is the Arabian Peninsula. Okay? Everybody who's from here is an Arab. Okay? It's an ethnicity. This is Egypt. This is North Africa. This is Persia. Okay? Not all of these people, just because they're Muslim, doesn't mean they're all the same. Arabic is one ethnicity. And what the Umayyads did is they emphasized the Arabic Muslim. They emphasized the Arabic language, the Arabic culture, um, and Arabs got better positions of leadership, better job opportunities. So the Umayyads emphasized the Arabic Muslim, the Arabic language, culture. If you're Persian, you don't want to be follow Arabic culture. If you're North African, Egyptian, you don't want to follow Arabic culture. Um, and also the Arabs got better job opportunities, leadership opportunities. That aggravated. I mean, this is a huge empire. Look at it compared to what Rome was, right? Little old Rome up here. Cute. Um, and in 750, so after about 100 years, um, the non-Arab Muslims revolt. Uh, so all the non-Arab Muslims revolt against this. Uh, they want fair treatment, and they overthrow the Umayyad dynasty. So then, oops, um, now replacing the Umayyad dynasty is going to be the Abbasid Caliphate, um, the Abbasid dynasty. Uh, their capital was actually in Damascus, uh, which is annoying that they have these two on this map. Damascus is right about here. They irritate right about there. Um, so the Abbasid dynasty was the capital was Damas Damascus. Um, their conquest, uh, they actually lost some land. Um, so they actually lost some territory compared to the Umayyad. So under conquest, I say they actually lost some land. Um, but if you look, they ruled for 500 years, way longer than the Umayyads did. Um, and so even though they contracted a little bit in size, they obviously were doing something right because they ruled for half a millennium. Um, and this is what I have for number two here, um, that all Muslims uh, shared in leadership. It wasn't just Arabs. They weren't just emphasizing the Arabic Muslims like the Umayyad had. Under the Abbasid, all Muslims shared in leadership. Um, and it really united much of the Ummah, much of this Islamic community. It brought them together. So that's the Abbasids. Um, next is the Ottomans. Um, the Ottomans started around the same time the Abbasids were on their way down. Sorry. Um, so we have the rise of the Ottoman Turks. Now, they're not actually initially rivals of the Abbasids. Um, they're kind of doing their thing at the same time. The Abbasids are on their way down as the Ottomans are on their way up. And so they're not really rivals. Don't think of them as competing against each other. Um, but the Ottomans, you see, um, start out small. Whoops, wrong, wrong button, O'Neill. Um, go back. Um, Start out small and then just gradually grow and kind of getting bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on through the 1300s and the 1400s. Um, and so their conquest, um, they have very impressive growth. Okay, they are, they are a remarkable case study into how to grow an empire. Um, if you're ever interested in that topic, the Ottomans are a particularly interesting one to read about. Um, they're the ones who defeated the Byzantine Empire in 1453. We talked about that. We talked about the fall of Constantinople. Uh, we watched the video about the walls. 
Um, it was the Turks who defeated the Byzantine Empire. If you remember, we also looked at that Byzantine Empire map as it got smaller, um, and that's a, that was largely at the uh, expense of the Turks. Um, the Turks also, um, a couple hundred years later, took a shot at Vienna, the Siege of Vienna in 1683. That's up here into the heart of Eastern Europe. Um, that's the furthest into Europe they got, uh, but then they were pushed back. Um, so the Siege of Vienna is the furthest they got, uh, but then they were pushed back. But if you look um, at the dates on this, the Ottoman Empire is going to exist until the 20th century. Started into, in 1299. Um, my wife Amy's grandmother was alive, was five years old when the Ottoman Empire was still a thing, when, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Like, it's still in the living memory of some people. Um, now, uh, their treatment of non-Muslims, uh, they were pretty fair. Uh, they, were, they, were, they treated all the people of the book pretty fairly. Um, they were a very conglomerate empire. There was a lot of religions, a lot of ethnicities. Um, and if you were Muslim, uh, if you were not Muslim, basically you got taxed at a higher rate. And that was about it. Everything else was uh, was pretty copacetic, was pretty good. Um, now, the views of the Ottoman Turks, um, Europe feared them. I mean, if you think about Europe and all the tiny little states up here, very little ones, you know, this huge Ottoman Empire that just is seen as a, a constant threat. Um, so the views of it, it Europe feared it. Um, but what we're going to see conversely is the Islamic world looks to the Ottoman Empire as its leader. Um, they are the strong, they are the dominant state. And so when Europe feared them, the Islamic world looked to the Ottomans as leaders. I'll look to the Ottoman Turks as the leaders. Uh, why don't we take a moment and give you a chance to catch up here a little bit, uh, touch base with your partner and see if uh, you're all filled in good with everything you need. And as we leave uh, the Ottoman Empire here, uh, we're going to go ahead and head on back to India. Uh, the last time we were in India was for your paper, was for the Golden Age. Um, and some of you wrote about the decline of the, uh, the Golden Age. And so that brings all kinds of different issues up. But what basically we're going to get to here um, is the Delhi Sultanate, it's called. Um, and so initially, we have Muslim powers who are coming in um, very violently, very, very um, wanting dramatic change from Central Asia. And so basically, we have a whole bunch of Turkic people. Oh, back a couple maps actually here. So we have a whole bunch of um, Turkic people from here and from Central Asia, some Persians who push into India uh, and basically take advantage of the collapsing uh, Golden Age, the collapsing uh, Gupta dynasty. And they are going to set up a kingdom in the north. Uh, and that's going to be called the Delhi Sultanate, named after the uh, it's the major city there of Delhi. Um, and what's interesting, though, is, well, Islam came to really much kind of conquer and populate many of the areas that it took over, um, and Islam became the dominant religion. Uh, that doesn't happen in the Delhi Sultanate. And Islam was always a minority religion in India. Um, never more than 20, 25% at most. Uh, that's what I had as the arrow, 20 to 25%. Um, so this is very unlike any of their other conquests. Um, and in fact, they lived somewhat separately from the majority Hindus. The Muslims kind of stayed hands off and stay, uh, not hands off, I shouldn't use that phrase, they, but they lived separately from the majority of Hindus. They lived in their own neighborhoods. They lived um, in their own cities, even at times. Um, and so um, Indi Indian Hindus still vastly outnumbered uh, the Muslims, uh, even though the Muslims were ruling at this point. Um, and then from India, it's actually Islam is going to spread to Southeast Asia. 
um, and it's going to spread to what we now call Indonesia, a whole bunch of these islands down here. Um, and that's a direct result of from India, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, now it doesn't spread, so from India it expands to Southeast Asia. That's what I call, that's what I'm saying, that's what the arrow is. Um, but not into China's sphere. Um, basically the area, this is the very Southern part of China here. Um, and all of this was still um, within China's sphere. Um, and if we remember, China was Buddhism, Japan was Buddhist, um, and these countries are generally leaning Buddhism also. Um, and so Islam kind of misses them and goes into Indonesia. Um, but this brings us to a really important part here. Um, and I just have this under the Delhi Sultanate. Um, is it's really important to understand this Indian Ocean trade. Um, and these trade routes are connecting so much of the Islamic world. If you look at um, from North Africa, Islam's going to spread down the coast um, from the Middle East, or excuse me, from Southwest Asia, um, India to Southeast Asia. Um, and these Indian Ocean routes and the Arabian, uh, Arabian Sea uh, trade routes that connects it all together. Um, and that's going to become a major part of our story of India and part of China as well. Um, but these trade routes um, really united much of the Ummah, much of the Islamic community. Uh, it almost became like a commercial institution um, as much as it was a, uh, a religious community also, um, because you have so many people connected commercially, connected with trade. Um, all of whom, many of whom can speak Arabic. Um, so it didn't matter if you were from Borneo, from India, or from Mogadishu, um, or from Cairo. It's that this Arabic language, the, the language of Islam, uh, connected the Ummah, connected the community. Ah, so there is your rapid, massive growth and really global growth of Islam. So thank you for your attention. Uh, if you want to take a minute and make sure you got everything filled in good, um, and then we'll be good to go. Thanks, gang.